All right. Do you all see my screen? Yes. All right. Well, welcome everyone to uh, the March AFO Cafe. My name is Matt Schumar. I am the vice president of AFO. And we're really happy to uh, that you're able to join us today. If you are not familiar with AFO, uh, we are a professional organization established in 1922, focused on the study and conservation of birds in their natural habitats. We're really excited and currently planning our annual meeting, which is going to be the second Ornithological Congress of the Americas, which will take place in Fermado, Brazil, the first week of August. So please put that on your calendar. We hope that you all can join us there uh, for that event. We have a number of confirmed plenary speakers so far, including uh, Andres Bosso, Camila Ribas, Joe Peacock, and Kini Rosler. Um, and we're adding more de details to the website daily, so please uh, check that, and we hope to announce that more information soon. We do have some important deadlines coming up uh, with respect to the conference. So just here in a couple of weeks, we have um, some, some deadlines. So we have a actually a super early bird registration uh, to try to encourage people to register for the conference in advance. Um, really discounted rates right now. So check the website out, which is linked here um, on the screen and um, look at the rates. Uh, we'll have another early bird registration period, uh, which will close on May 15th. But also in the next couple of weeks, we are accepting travel awards uh, from students and early career professionals and proposals for roundtables, workshops, and symposia. So if you have an idea to contribute to the conference, please get in touch with us uh, soon uh, because we'd like to make decisions about those in the very near future. We're on uh, a short timeline, but we're excited to host this meeting in Brazil uh, with our partners. The first Congress in Argentina was a fantastic event and we're really looking forward to this meeting. So hopefully you all can join us. We're Switching to doing the AFO Cafe is currently about every other month uh, this year. What we're doing a little bit differently uh, moving forward is separating our members meeting from the annual conference. Um, we hope to have these virtually um, in the first half of the year um, so that we can engage more of our members um, and participate in events like this. Um, so we'll actually be having a, a virtual members meeting um, sometime in May. We'll be announcing those details soon. So if you're an AFO member, you'll get an email um, about that. And we'll also post that on our social media accounts. So in addition to the regular business meeting that we have, which covers all of the things that AFO has done in the past year and the things that we're working on um, in the future, we're also going to have a presentation um, to, to lighten it up a little bit and um, to encourage everybody to attend and that will focus on the birds of Gramado. So hopefully that gets you really excited um, about the Congress and looking forward to joining us later on this year. The AFO cafes are sponsored by Avonet Research Supplies. Um, Avonet is our, our store to sell field equipment and they're fantastic because this allows us to provide funding for all of the things that AFO does. So uh, proceeds from Avonet sales go to funding our grants programs and awards and conferences as well. Um, with the field season here, um, at least in North America, coming up for many of us, um, now's a great time to, to check out um, Avonet. If you have an idea for a future AFO Cafe event, um, get in touch with us. We'd love to hear what you're interested in, in hearing about and participating in. So you can send information to afo.communications at gmail.com. And we would love to hear uh, what you're interested in, in hearing about or learning about. Um, you can also support these events um, and all that we do through AFO by becoming a member. Um, this is a fantastic community. I've been really fortunate to be a part of it um, in the last several years. So if you aren't a, an AFO member, we welcome you to join the society and, and participate in all of our events. So without further ado, I would like to introduce this month's speaker. Uh, with us today, we have Jay Wright, who's the Director of Conservation Science at Toledo Metro Parks. Um, 
before, prior to that, Jay did his PhD work um, at Ohio State University, uh, where I'm based. Um, I've been fortunate to work with Jay over the past several years, uh, both through his uh, PhD work. And I was actually able to um, host uh, a field site um, on, on my property uh, for some of Jay's work. So it's been really exciting to, to see the field components of this. And you're all in for uh, a treat. This is a really interesting study. and, and um, really fortunate to to kind of see Jay uh, progress through this. Um, and prior to that, he did his master's research at The Ohio State University as well, looking at the migration ecology of rusty blackbirds. Um, so thanks again, Jay, and thanks for everybody for joining us. So I'll stop sharing now and uh, turn it over to Jay. All right, um, let's see, everybody can hear me, I'm assuming? Yes. Cool. Yep. All right, so thanks, Matt, um, and thanks, AFO, for, for asking me and inviting me to do this. Um, so yeah, I'm excited to kind of talk about my PhD research here today. Um, I, uh, yeah, I'll just, I'll just get right into it. Um, the core of my research here is a uh, seed dispersal mutualism between plants and animals. So, um, you know, most most mutualism mutualisms between plants and animals are either a uh, pollination service or a um, or dispersal service for the plant. And so, really, what's happening here is the animal is usually gaining food, and the plant is gaining a reproductive service. So, the uh, mutualism I'm looking at here is between nut bearing trees and uh, animals that cache those seeds or those nuts for later winter consumption. So most people know of this mutualism through squirrels, right? So everybody sees squirrels out there in the fall. Did my computer freeze or did Jay's? Jays, I think. I, I think know. it's Jays. Yeah. 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 I can't hear him either. Well, let me. I can send him a text. <laughs> Something just happened here. Um, I'll just go back to. Okay, what was I here? Are you guys seeing my screen again? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I'm not, not sure. Happen. Um, all right, so so yeah, most um so blue jays are arguably better dispersers than squirrels um in this relationship, especially be between small, uh, small seeded nuts. Um, of course, one reason is because they can fly, so they can transport the seed than, um, than kind of land-based uh, terrestrial mammals. Um, they can also fit multiple acorns or, and other nuts in their bill and in their throat pouch. So you can see this photo here of the blue jay with three or potentially even four acorns. But really one of the biggest reasons that, that they are so good at um, kind of providing these dispersal services to trees is that their caching behavior is what we call scatter hoarding. So that means that every time they take an acorn from a tree, they're transporting it to a different site, a different cache site. So this is as opposed to larder hoarding. So um, animals like red squirrels or chipmunks often just have a single or one or two single hordes often underground or in trees. So woodpeckers also do this. Um, and you know this is not really a very beneficial place for for seeds to be, right? If it's like deep underground or they're all in one place. So a scatter hoarding animals like blue jays, also uh, gray squirrels, are really much more important and really kind of key to the dispersal of of these nut bearing trees. And so habitat um, often they're colonizing new habitat. And then, um, you know, they're really 
potentially, and we'll look at look at this in my research, putting these seeds in places that are potentially beneficial uh, for, for seed germination and growth. So I just want to, since kind of oak trees are one of the biggest um, things I'll be talking about here with my study, I just want to give a little bit more background on why they're important and why their blue jays are sometimes seen as ecosystem engineers because they're such a key dispersal agent for oak trees. So this is getting to be maybe common knowledge now through uh, Doug Tallamy's work, but you know, oak trees support a vast amount of Lepidoptera species, so the larva of uh, moth and butterflies, much more than any other um, North American tree family. So well over 500 species feed on oak leaves. And then of course, these, um, these insects then support diverse communities, diverse and abundant communities of, of neotropical migrants like cerulean warblers and others, um, as well as um, other kind of cascading effects through this uh, food abundance. And then of course, acorns themselves are a food source for over 90 or, or I think maybe over hundred wildlife species. Um, some of these are really important game species like turkeys and wood ducks and deer. Some of these animals uh, really rely on acorns. Some just eat them kind of incidentally, but they're really a healthy, really important food source, especially for, for overwintering animals. So since acorn production is really a big part of my research, I want to give a little bit more background on and details on the acorn production. So often when you talk about oaks, there are two groups here. There's the red oaks and the white oaks. And these are um, sometimes classified as like subgenera of the oak genus. And you can kind of easily tell the difference in a lot of cases on the leaves with the kind of pointy leaves being red oaks and the sort of rounded leaves being white oaks. But really the important differences here for the acorns is that red oak acorns take two years to mature after pollination. So once a, a, um, a flower is pollinated, it's actually not until the year after that that um, that, that acorn is mature. Red oak acorns have a dormancy period. So after they fall off the tree, they are dormant for the winter and they don't start germinating until the following spring. Red oaks tend to have more tannins. So this imparts a bitter taste um, it also kind of binds up with protein, so it makes the protein aspect of the acorns hard to digest for a lot of animals, especially mammals. Um, but they also have more fat, so there's more fat and less protein in acorns or in red oaks. The white oak group of acorns take only one year to mature after pollination, so they're pollinated and then that right coming fall, they're, they're ready for um, the acorns are ready. They do not have a dormancy period, so once white oak, white oak acorns fall, almost immediately within a few weeks, they'll start germinating. So they don't really store as well over winter as red oaks. They have fewer tannins. So that means that they're not quite as bitter. They're a little bit sweeter taste. So for animals that that uh, where taste matters, that could come into it. Um, but they have a more, a greater protein re reward, but less of a fat reward. So fewer lipids in white oaks. Another really important aspect of acorn production is uh, these masting cycles that oaks have. So what this means is that oak trees have evolved to have a synchronized, spatially synchronized acorn production over large areas. So, you know, several hundred miles in area, you might have all the oaks kind of producing an older one year, in the years they might produce very little, some years they might produce an average amount. So just as an example, this figure here is uh, showing acorn surveys from the Ohio Division of Wildlife from 2005 to 2020. So on the uh, y-axis, uh, y we're looking at the average percent of trees that are bearing acorns. And really, if we look at this red line here, we can see that over the years, we have some years of really high abundance of acorns. The next year might be really low. It might fluctuate year to year. You might have some um, consecutive years of higher or low. So it's really unpredictable. Um, it's very hard to determine ahead of time what is going to what the acorn crop is going to be like. Although there are some cues that seem to work, um, but just really the point here is that acorn production is wildly variable and um, synchronized spatially over a large area. And because of this uh, huge sort of pulse or lack of a pulse in resources um, in forests where oaks are dominant, there's a lot of cascading effects of these mast cycles. And 
you know, since acorns kind of feed some uh, many different animals, uh, there are really numerous interacting factors across trophic levels as a result of, of these mast cycles. In addition, there might be time lags. So it might take two or three years for some of these effects to be seen. So let's just look at some examples here. This figure is showing two examples of a low acorn or what you might call a mast failure year versus a high mast year. So in a low mast year, uh, mice, especially mice, which, uh, which really rely on acorns, they might have a lower survival over the winter and they're gonna be able to support fewer young that following spring. So you're gonna see some reductions in mouse populations after a low acorn year. You also might see fewer deer in that area as deer eat a lot of acorns as well. And then this is gonna see a response all the way to Lyme disease. So it takes part of their life cycle stage depends on mice. And if we have a lower mouse population, there's gonna be fewer available ticks in the landscape. And then we'll even see uh, lower uh, aspects of or lower cases of Lyme disease in humans. Uh, looking the other way, the lower mouse population or lower rodents in general might be better for some ground nesting birds. So uh, rodents are one of the main predators for ground nesting birds. So we might see a greater success in a breeding success for ground nesting birds following a mast year. And then of course the inverse is true in a high mast year. So we're gonna have greater mice and deer populations. Uh, we might have more ticks and more Lyme disease in humans that year, but we also, also might see greater predation from, from those healthy rodent populations. And these are just some examples and then these will then carry up the food chain as well to some degree. So, you know, we might have hawks or owls that feed on birds, seeing, seeing some population level responses to, to the rodent or the um, bird responses to these acorns. And a lot of these are going to be time lags. So it, it takes a little bit longer for, for those higher trophic level uh, animals to respond to the, the initial response of those lower trophic levels. And then a little bit more background, um, some more context on my research before I get into it. So, so all of this that I'm looking at with, with blue jays and oaks and um, how this is gonna influence forests is in the context of forest change in the Eastern US. So there's two aspects of forest change I'm gonna talk about. The first is the ongoing decline of oaks. There are a lot of reasons for this. Um, the main thing I'm gonna highlight just right now is the process of mesofication. So this is kind of the most widespread um, and kind of long, long-term decline that's that's been happening. And really what this term means is that forests are becoming uh, shadier and a more humid and cool microclimate as a result of lack of fire on the landscape. So there used to be a lot more fires. Um, you know, the indigenous people used to set fire a lot more to forests uh, prior to the 20th and 19th centuries. And so our forests, especially oak hickory dominated forests, so you can see that in the dark green on this map where these really oak hickory forests are in the east, those were a lot more open than they currently are. So the, there was a lot more light reach, reaching the understory and oaks are a fire adapted species. So you know burning through these forests was really healthy for oaks, it improved oak regeneration and it kept out some of these more shade tolerant species. But through fire suppression policies throughout the 20th century, we started to see this canopy kind of close. So there was less light getting to the understory. Um, that meant that the understory trees that were succeeding were not those shade intolerant, not those fire adapted species, but species that were more adapted to shade. So um, trees like maple and beech. And then over time, as, as our uh, canopy oaks die out, they're going to be replaced by these shade tolerant species like maple and beech because and poplar um, because oaks have not been able to succeed in the understory. So this is the process of mesification, which is why we're we're sort of fighting against that with with land management to try and find ways to um, make sure that oak can still regenerate uh, sufficiently in the understory. So the other process of forest change that my research is um, touches on is the potential or the anticipated reintroduction of American chestnut. So probably most of you know, but uh, American chestnut was once a fairly dominant species, especially in the mountainous areas of the Appalachians. So here you can see some photos of really large uh, chestnuts that used to be in the Appalachians. 
And they were really an important species for both human communities and also wildlife communities. So in, this, in the same way that oaks support wildlife communities, chestnuts did as well, especially because they did not have these masting cycles. They have fairly constant um, seed production. But in the early 20th century, a, uh, a fungal blight with disease was introduced, started killing all the mature trees. And within about 40 years, by the 1940s or so, most of the mature chestnuts were dead. Um, they still persist to this day in the understory as stump sprouts um, to some degree and as saplings. But for the most part, when they reach uh, a certain age, often before reproductive age, the blight, which is still in the landscape, kind of infects them and they die back again. So since the uh, about the 1980s, there have been some breeding efforts to try and find ways to have blight resistant chestnuts. Um, originally through through hybrid, so breeding with, with Chinese chestnuts or others that were resistant to the blight and trying to kind of have back crosses that were mostly American chestnut. And then more recently through some transgenic um, uh, manipulation of 100% of, uh, American chestnut trees. So we're getting closer, we're, we're nearing the point where we have blight resistant trees that are suitable for reintroducing onto the landscape and so this is a process that, that we may see kind of changing um, and influencing eastern forests. Okay, so with all that background on open birds and, and forests, the question here I'm looking at really is how will the mutualism between blue jays and nut bearing trees shape the future of eastern hardwood forests, especially in relation to the decline of oak forests and the potential reintroduction of American chestnut? And the way that I'm going to look at this is sort of in two main areas. So I'm going to look at first the dynamics of scatterhorn and behavior, and especially kind of separating out the seed preference, the seed selection of blue jays, and then also looking at their dispersal effectiveness for different species. And then on the other hand, I'm also going to look at a broader sort of population level. So how are blue jay populations and how is blue jay abundance related to these fluctuating acorn mask cycles? Um, mainly through uh, two studies, so an overwinter survival study in Ohio, uh, in Southeast Ohio, and then also looking at a number of long-term data sets. All right, so let's get into the first part of my study here, um, looking at seed selection of blue jays. So really here I wanted to know, this is mainly in relation to chestnut, so are birds going to prefer chestnuts over other available nuts? Uh, so I set up six platforms throughout the forest in Southeast Ohio at two sites down there. So Matt Schumar's property was one of them and then also the Vinton Furnace Experimental Forest. Um, and I was baiting these platforms early in the fall with peanuts. And once blue jays were coming regularly, I would then start these seed selection trials. So I had uh, cameras mounted on the platform as you can maybe see here. And this would record all of the um, removals of, of, uh, of nuts. And I'm using here two oak species that were the kind of dominant oaks in this landscape. So that's white oaks and black oaks. And black oaks are, are in the sort of red oak group that I talked about before. And then I also used American chestnuts. So I just want to show a video here so you can kind of see what these seed selection trials look like. So each of these holes that are drilled in this board here would start off with having a seed in it. And they're kind of separated by, um, by species here. So this bird, it already has an acorn and looks like it's trying to fit a second acorn in its bill. Um, maybe a young bird hasn't quite figured it out yet, but if you watch this next bird that comes, it's much, uh, it really knows what it's doing and it quickly takes two acorns if you watch closely. So that went down to his throat pouch, didn't like that one and flew off of that. So that's pretty typical. Um, if, if acorns are small enough, they'll kind of tuck one back in their throat pouch and take a second acorn or potentially a third and fly off with it. And I'm going to show one more video um, from a different angle. And um, I'll kind of explain why I have this angle. You can't see the board, obviously, but what you can see, what you can see is um, the legs of the bird. So here, this is a tufted titmouse. I won't talk about the other species that came. I in my research, I did kind of quantify selection for uh, tip mice and several other species. Um, 
But here, blue jays, so you can see this bird is banded. So this was part of the um, overwinter survival study. And I also, for part of the seed selection experiment, um, looked at individual preference. So since I had some banded birds, I was able to kind of look at how, how the preference changed just based on certain individuals. I won't talk about those results here, but um, it is something that I looked at. Okay, so I'm just gonna give really the most basic results for this, just to have time to get through all the rest of my study. So really what I found was that black oaks were the most preferred and chestnuts were, were kind of moderately preferred um, between the two oak species. So they were, they were pretty preferred over white oak acorns, but less than black oak. And I used a uh, Bayesian discrete choice model for this analysis that accounted for the presence of, of all the seeds at any individual selection. Uh, and so some of the reasons for this preference, probably the, the top reason is seed size. So, so there have been other blue jay um, seed preference studies. So mine is not the first one by any means. And pretty consistently, they seem to select the smallest acorns available. So if you're familiar with pin oak acorns, those are really quite small. And anytime those are in an experiment, those are pretty much the, the preferred. Uh, and I think that's because they can fit more of them in their pouch and in their bill. So when they're caching acorns, they have to make fewer trips. Um, I think nutrition also plays a role here. So one thing that I'm not really showing here is that there was a greater preference for black oak later in the season. So during like the winter period, when it was colder, the preference for black oak was even stronger than it was earlier in the season. And so I think part of that might be that the black oaks have the, the greatest um, fat and lipid reward here. So there's a higher caloric reward in black oak acorns than there is in the others. Um, I'm often asked about uh, palatability or taste. Um, can Does that play into it? Probably not for blue jays since black oaks here would have been the sort of least uh, flavor or you know the most bitter, the least tasty. Um, so it's probably not uh, something that matters to blue jays. Also dormancy status, are they able to tell whether or not the acorn they're taking is gonna have, is gonna store well? Um, so there is evidence that squirrels, or at least some squirrels can determine this and they'll often sort of uh, bite off the, um, the sort of embryonic end of the white oak acorns to prevent them from germinating. So, so that energy isn't used up. Um, of course, that was confounded in this study um, with these other things like seed size and nutrition. Um, so I don't really have a lot of evidence and I haven't really seen much evidence that, dorm that blue jays are able to tell dormancy status at this point, but don't really know. All right, so I'm gonna move on to this part of the study looking at uh, the dispersal effectiveness. And so here, what I mean by dispersal effectiveness is um, how, just how good are they at providing that dispersal service to these different trees? So I wanted to know where and how far are blue jays caching seeds? And are those cache sites gonna be beneficial for seedling growth for, for those um, three species? So I did this with those same um, white oak, black oak, and chestnut as the previous part. And the way that I did this was by tracking the, um, the nuts themselves. So I would uh, put a little small transmitter inside of the acorns and the chestnuts, present those at the platform, and then use radio telemetry to kind of home in on those acorns, determine the fate, whether they were eaten or whether they were cached or something else. And then of course, locate those caches if they were cached. And then I also wanted to kind of follow up, returning to those cache sites and planting viable seeds where I hadn't kind of drilled a hole out, um, planting viable seeds and then tracking those, uh, the survival of those seeds over the course of the growing season. So I'm going to play two more videos. Um, I like these two are kind of nice because they sort of encapsulate the seed preference results as sort of like an anecdotal um, view here. So at the start of this video, so normally I would have laid out kind of nine tag seeds here, so three of each species, and one chestnut has already been removed by a woodpecker before this video starts. So here, this blue jay quickly takes a black oak acorn, flies off with it. This next bird takes another black oak acorn. And that's a white oak that he tried and didn't really like that white oak acorn. 
And white oak acorns are the biggest, so it's probably the size of it. And then that's a chestnut. So that bird flew off with a, a black oak acorn and a chestnut. And then the next video pretty much picks up where this left off. So this bird is taking the black oak acorn, the last one. So now all that's left here are three white oak acorns and a chestnut. And again, you saw that bird didn't really like that white oak acorn. So that bird snags the last chestnut. And then here, if you haven't seen it before, it's what it looks like when it's an acorn. So obviously they're not swallowing them whole, they're hammering through the outer shell and um, just bit by bit, they're kind of eating the, um, the meat of the acorn on the inside. Um, so they're not ever gonna swallow that transmitter. Uh, when they get to the transmitter that's on the inside of the acorn, they recognize that it's not food and they just drop it on the ground. So whenever a bird um, took an acorn and decided to eat it, I would just find the transmitter just kind of by itself on the, on the ground. All right, so then I, once the platforms were cleared, I would get out the antenna and receiver, use radio telemetry to home in, and then hopefully find caches like this chestnut cache here. Um, so when Blue Jays cache, it's similar to squirrels. They kind of hammer it into the ground a bit and cover it up with leaf litter and maybe some of that duff layer. And so let's look, look at some of the um, results of dispersal distance first. So the x-axis here is just showing the cache distance from the origin platforms. Um, I also did some natural observations of birds taking acorns from trees and then tracking them to a cache site. That was much more difficult. So um, the first couple of years, I didn't really have much data for that. But the last year of the study, there were a lot of blue jays, there was a lot of acorns. And so I had a lot more opportunities. And so I was able to get some of those uh, natural observations. Anyhow, um, what we see here is that most of the caches are within about 100 to 150 meters of the platform or the tree of origin. Um, but we did have some dispersal distances up to about 450 meters. Um, and the thing to note here is that, first of all, there were no detected differences, at least uh, between those three species. So they were all approximately being dispersed about the same distance. Um, and I'll just note that longer dispersal distances are certainly um, possible in different habitat. So my study site, or my main, main study site here was a fairly contiguous forest uh, with just some patches of early successional, but mostly uh, it's mostly just mature forest. So there's not really any need to transport acorns very far. But in other studies where it's a fragmented landscape with a lot of agriculture, they'll transport seeds several miles from a tree. So up to four or five kilometers from a tree, you might see some, um, some dispersal distance. And then also looking at the habitat preferences for cache sites, they pretty clearly just liked early successional shrubby habitat for, for these cache sites. Um, so if we look at this map here, this is kind of the map of the main study site. The triangles are the platforms, and then all the circles are the cache sites. And so you can really see that in this zoomed in panel here, almost all the cache sites are out in the early successional patch. They're rarely caching in the mature forest. Um, so this is really probably because those shrubby early successional areas just have a lot more cover. So when they're kind of going to cache seeds, there's not uh, many birds or other animals that are able to see them. So there's more, um, kind of visible protection cover. There's also cover from predators when they're kind of busy doing their caching. So whereas in the open forest, it's a little bit more of a clear understory and not as much cover. So like I said, I returned to these cache sites. Um, I also forgot to mention that each cache site I would uh, pair with a randomly generated site at the same distance from the platform. So I was kind of comparing cache sites versus random sites uh, for this experiment here. And so I'd return to these sites and plant viable seeds, uh, one of each species inside a predator-proof cage. So I didn't want animals to get to those, um, but I also planted three seeds outside of the cage so I could um, estimate the pilferage or the recovery rate uh, of these seeds. And then I returned uh, approximately monthly to track the germination and growth of those seedlings. And then of course, gather a lot of vegetation and habitat data. So really what I ended up with after tracking all these seeds was something like this for 
for each species. Um, it looks a little bit kind of confusing maybe at first glance, uh, but I'll just kind of go through it and break it down a little bit so it's not that hard to follow. Um, so I have one of these, this is for American chestnut dispersal, and I have one of these for each species. So if I just kind of gray out most of it, we'll just kind of focus on this diagonal line. And so all we're looking at here is basically the survival of seeds as they progress from one stage to the next, all the way till the end of the first growing season. Um, so we start with seeds that are selected or just taken off the platform by blue jays. And then these numbers that are alongside the black lines are just showing the proportion that experienced that uh, fate. So 32% of seeds that were taken by blue jays or, or of chestnuts were cached, whereas over here, 52% were consumed. And then of those cached seeds, um, only 18% went unrecovered or unpilfered. So the majority of those were, uh, were pilfered or were kind of predated. And then as we move down the line, we're looking at uh, stem emergence after germination, seedling growth. Um, and then I kind of had some of these other analyses I don't want to really talk about here, which all, this, all these green boxes are the vegetation analyses I did for each stage. And then ultimately, we're looking at what was the total survival of seeds by the end of the season. So for chestnuts, it was um, point. So it was six, about six point two percent of seeds that were cached by blue jays survived to the end of the end of the growing season. So that's kind of the the quantification of their dispersal effectiveness that I have for each species. So if I just kind of pull out the key results from, if you were to look in detail at all three of those figures, um, and just kind of highlight what I found here. All three of those species had high pilferage rates. So greater than 80% of the cash seeds were gonna be either taken by rodents or birds. Um, I was not able in, in this study to determine who was taking those seeds that were outside of the cages, but most of the sign that I saw was from rodents uh, coming up through either underneath or through the litter layer. So that's gonna be a really limiting factor for how effective blue jays can be at dispersing seeds. Um, the seedling survival was at the end of the first year was greatest for chestnut and least for white oak, uh, but that's probably more just related to the um, greater competitive ability of chestnut compared to oaks at that early stage. So oaks are investing a lot more in um, below ground growth early on, uh, whereas chestnuts are kind of investing more in above ground growth and have a little bit greater survival there as a result of that. And then there was some evidence for what we call directed dispersal for oaks. So this just means that um, for, this was only for oaks and not for chestnut. Um, there was greater stem emergence at cache sites compared to random sites. So basically the directed dispersal is just saying that the animal doing the dispersal is um, bringing seeds to sites that are more beneficial for the growth of the seed than, than random. All right, so moving on to the overwinter survival study here. Um, I really wanted to know here was just the winter survival of blue jays dependent on acorn abundance and uh, what other factors might influence the winter survival of blue jays. So here, this was a three year study and I was using just the three years. Um, the idea was that we would have kind of natural variation in acorn abundance over those three years. So that's how we would kind of relate blue jay survival or overwinter survival to acorn abundance. Um, but I'll kind of show how that played out. And, you know, we just captured birds by mist net we, and baited potter traps, used rare telemetry to track survival. And, and as I said, that kind of annual variation mass abundance to compare uh, those years. And then I'll just kind of throw this out. We did use a combination of automated telemetry. So using MODIS towers at the site as well as tracking to really just confirm survival every over the winter period, which was uh, early December to mid-April for this study. So over those three years, um, we tracked 86 birds and had quite a bit of mortality. So 25 birds were predated um, during the study. And as you can see here, the vast majority of those were uh, young. So this is, you know, after hatch year birds. One of the 25 mortalities were young birds. And so most of the time, you know, I just find a pile of feathers or something. Um, 
I think a lot of the predation was probably by Cooper's hawks. Uh, we also had a fair number of red-shouldered hawks at the site. Um, I did have one, at least one instance of a barred owl, uh, or a, at least a assumed, presumed barred owl predation here. So this was an owl pellet, and you can see the foot of the bird and the antenna kind of wrapped around in the pellet. Uh, and the bands, of course, were were still in there too. Um, but yeah, probably mostly hawks and and maybe some owl predation going on here. So I used the Cox proportional hazards model to um, to model the survival of birds, and you know I, I really wanted to see what might be influencing survival. So I looked at multiple aspects of weather, um, including you know snow cover. Uh, low temperature degree days and all that kind of stuff, sex, body size, um, bill size. So I, I kind of measured different aspects of the bill to see if uh, birds with larger bills were going to be more successful at surviving the winter. All that came out was age. <laughs> so, so young birds obviously had much lower survival probability than adult birds. Um, nothing else really came out as significant in predicting overwinter survival. Um, and so, you know, the year effect, which was really our proxy for a mast influence also was not, um, did not show any strong influence here. So not too much takeaway there, except for the fact that, you know, those young birds are really getting hit hard during, over the winter, which is important. And I'll get to that in just a minute. All right. So the last part of this, and I'm doing okay in time. The last part of this is looking at those kind of greater abundance dynamics so our blue jay population is influenced by mast abundance. And the way that I looked at this was by using several long-term data sets uh, for up to 15 years. So I used, I wanted to look at blue jay abundance during the summer and also during the winter. So I used breeding bird survey data as well as Christmas bird count data. And then I used multiple um, state agency data sets of, of acorn abundance. Um, and so what I did was pair the abundance surveys, so the breeding bird and the Christmas bird count surveys with the nearest acorn survey areas. Um, and I tried to get those within 10 kilometers. And that left me with 174 BBS routes and 114 Christmas bird count circles. And this was across uh, eight states where I was able to get that acorn abundance data. And I used mixed effects models with site as a random effect to evaluate this. Um, the way that I built the models is maybe a little bit confusing, but really all you kind of need to know is just to remember back to those cascading effects. So, you know, some of these effects that that these fluctuating mass cycles can have might um, have lagged effects. So it might take a year or two for, for that to be seen. So when I was kind of looking at the relationship between acorn mass abundance and blue jay abundance, I also wanted to look at previous years. So basically for any given year, I also looked at the year before and the year before that um, to compare mass abundance. So I did that for both winter using the Christmas bird count data, and then also the summer using the uh, BBS data. So just point out some of the key results. The strongest result I found was that there was a direct effect. And I forgot to mention before I get to this, that all of those um, state agency acorn surveys are separated by the subgenus. So they're separated by red oak and white oak abundance. Um, so I do have that kind of difference in here. So there was a direct effect of red oak mast on winter blue jay abundance of that same year. So this figure just kind of shows what that the strength of that relationship was. So as the red oak mast index was higher in a given fall, that same winter, so just a couple months later when the Christmas bird count happened, there was also a higher number of blue jays. It's a little bit easier to see this if we look at individual um, site level figures over time. So here we have just four figures from four different states, um, or really individual sites in, in four different states from anywhere from 2006 or 2008 through 2020. And here the solid line is blue jay abundance and the dotted line is the acorn mast index. So you can kind of see how they match up pretty well. So there's really a high degree of fluctuation between years in some of these. And the blue jays and the acorns are kind of, for the most part, not every year, but in many years, they're matching quite well. So that's kind of where you can kind of see the strong link between red oak mast and blue jay abundance. 
We did also find some um, lagged effects of white oak mast. So the really interesting thing was that there was a lag effect of white oak mast. Um, so the year before the given um, Christmas bird count year, there was a negative influence of white oak mast. So as white oak mast was greater, there were lower the year before, there were lower number of blue jays that year following that white oak mast index. And then we did find also a weak uh, positive interaction with white oak mast and blue jay abundance, which don't really know how to explain, but I'll, I'll make an attempt at an explanation of the um, negative relationship with white oak. So if you think back to the cascading effects, um, one thing that often happens is that uh, as rodent populations respond positively to an acorn, uh, high acorn mast year, you're also going to see some predators like hawks or owls respond positively following fall and winter to, um, to those increased uh, rodent populations and those higher uh, breeding success of rodents. So if we're having an influx of predators to a given area because of those rodent responses, we might also see kind of spillover to uh, those predators predating on blue jays as well. So that is one potential explanation. I, it's kind of, I don't have evidence that it happened at my in my study, but it's one possible explanation for why we would see a negative relationship with white oak mess the year after. So we also did see a, um, a relationship between winter abundance and the previous summer abundance. So what that means is that if we had, you know, a kind of good, healthy abundance of blue jays during the breeding bird survey, that was carrying over at that site to having higher winter abundance during the Christmas bird count in the same area. Although we did not see the inverse relationship. So summer abundance was not related to a previous winter abundance. Um, and there was no clear influence of mass dynamics on summer abundance of birds. So what it looks like is that something is happening between sort of early winter when those Christmas bird counts are happening and the summer to kind of eliminate that relationship between blue jays and oaks that we saw um, with the Christmas bird count data. And one possibility is that that increased predation is really kind of removing the doomed surplus of birds that it may have been brought into a site because of a uh, high mast. But if we're also seeing an increase in predators, maybe that's removing any of that surplus. So that relationship is kind of eliminated by the time the summer comes around. So to look at this, I also compared Cooper's hawk and blue jay uh, winter abundance, and they were pretty strongly correlated. So that's some evidence maybe that the Cooper's hawks are making decisions on where to settle for the winter based on their, their prey abundance. And blue jays are certainly one of their important prey items. Uh, blue jays and robins and morning doves are really important prey items for, for Cooper's hawks. So um, if we just kind of try and bring all this together, all aspects of this study and talk about a little bit of, you know, some of the implications for oak management. Um, you know, some things I could say is that blue jays will probably, or they are especially effective dispersers for black oak and, and also likely pin oak. I didn't look at, at that in my study, but um, they're likely very good dispersers of these preferred acorns like black oak and pin oak. And that the caching, the habitat caching preferences of blue jays does align fairly well with oak management practices. So, um, you know, oak management, you're trying to open up the understory, create high light conditions in the understory, which is often good for, um, for some of that early successional growth. And so that's providing more cover. So you might, you know, oak land managers that are trying to um, have more oak regeneration and manage for oak might have a kind of a uh, efficient ally in, in dispersing with these blue jays. And I would say that diverse oak forests are probably going to be the best for, for encouraging dispersal by jays. So I say this because if you have a, um, you know, just one kind of oak tree. So if say you have like all black oak, yes, they prefer black oak, but if there's a low black oak mast year, then the blue jays are not gonna settle there. And so you just won't have any dispersal in those years. If you have a diverse oak forest um, at any given, in any given year, you're gonna have maybe different, um, different mast abundances and different species. So if you have enough species, usually they are willing to eat those less preferred species like white oaks. They, they certainly will eat and cache those, those acorns as well. So you might kind of encourage blue jays to stay in the forest by having a diverse community. 
Um, looking at the abundance study, I would say that blue jay populations are probably not limited by these short-term changes in acorn abundance. So in the short term, there's not like a lot of, um, because that because that relationship is being kind of eliminated by the time the breeding season comes along, they're maybe not really limited by this. Um, however, long-term declines in the oak would probably lead to, to blue jay declines and reduce dispersal, which could lead to a um, kind of feedback loop where fewer oak trees on the landscape are uh, kind of driving lower blue jay populations, and then that's going to have lower dispersal opportunities for oaks. So have that a kind of positive feedback loop happening there. And I will say the blue jay populations range wide have already shrunk by about 30% over the last 50 years. So this we may already be seeing some of the uh, influences of mesification here potentially. Chestnut restoration. Again, I would say that blue jays and uh, potentially some other birds that I didn't really talk about here would be effective dispersers of, of chestnut, especially when uh, black oak and other preferred mast fails. So in those failure years, since chestnuts are preferred over some acorns like white oaks, we might kind of have some pretty good dispersal of chestnuts in those years. The caching preferences of blue jays also aligns fairly well with, with uh, early chestnut growth requirements. So having more light in the understory, chestnuts like that. Um, so we have another ally here. And again, um, if you wanted to optimize dispersal by, by jays, um, in areas, you probably want to have areas that are dominated by less preferred oak species. But again, you would want to have them be fairly diverse. So I say, you know, if you have less preferred oak species like white oak, they may be more enticed to take chestnuts for their caching. And lastly, I would just say um, there are several kind of chestnut colonization models out there and kind of looking at trying to find out how long it might take to for chestnut to start spreading across the landscape once we start out plantings. And I think that some of these can be refined a bit to incorporate some of this J dispersal, especially the habitat preferences and seeing where we might see a more, um, yeah, a more focused uh, sort of colonization spread based on the habitat. And that, I just wanna thank um, some people here. So my advisor is Chris Tonner and Steve Matthews at Ohio State. Uh, my also collaborator, Leela Pincho. Um, of course, Matt Schumar and Molly McDermott provided their property for part of the study. Um, and then Bill Barovica, the manager at, at Vinton Furnace, my field technicians, uh, my lab and field help, and then folks at the American Chestnut Foundation for helping, helping me a lot with getting all those chestnut seeds that I needed. And then also I want to thank funding um, from Ohio State University, Society, the Chestnut Foundation, Kirtland Bird Club and cooperation of the Forest Service and the Ohio Division of Wildlife. All right, and I think I can take any questions. I guess I'll stop sharing. That was great, Jay, thanks. Um, so yeah, I encourage everybody, um, feel free to turn on your microphones and videos now. And um, if you have questions for Jay, um, let us know. We do have a couple people joining on YouTube as well. No question so far. So I do have a a question in that was direct to me, which I think I okay. could go ahead and answer. So it says, blue jays sometimes make large fall movements, possibly affected by local mast levels. How might such movements influence the relationships you found or did not find between summer and winter J numbers? Yeah, so that is, I would love to do a blue jay migration study. Um, migration, I kind of had it, I didn't say it, but it was kind of like in there a little bit on the one of the last slides or something. That's a big question mark. So I, I've looked into this and I don't really have a great answer for what drives um, blue jay migration. Uh, we know that they sometimes migrate uh, some years and some years they don't. I haven't really seen any studies that I know of um, that have looked at if mast influences those movements, um, but I would love to, to know more about that. Um, and so, yeah, the migration aspect could definitely be driving some of what we've found in, um, 
in those winter abundance levels. And I will just say uh, sort of anecdotally with my three years of, of the study in Southeast Ohio, um, the second year of the study, there were very few blue jays around and every I had to really struggle to capture birds and every almost every bird that I captured, not quite, but almost every bird I captured was an adult. Whereas the first and the third year, there were just a bunch of young birds out there. So, you know, one explanation is that, oh, they had a really poor breeding success year in that area in the middle year. Uh, I think it's more likely that, that the first and the third year, we had an influx of young migrant birds to the area. And unfortunately, you know, I was tagging a lot of those birds, but once they left the immediate site, I didn't have any idea of knowing where they went or how far they went. You know, I did, they were modus tags. So if they were detected in the larger modus network, um, I would have that data. And I believe two of the birds were detected in Northern Ohio um, and potentially Pennsylvania. So there was definitely some, some migrants at my site, um, but for the vast majority of the birds, once they disappeared from the site, I didn't really know where they went. Yeah. Cool. Well, we got a couple in, in chat, but go ahead, Kevin. I see your hands up. So. Yeah, I was wondering about your survival data. And uh, did you try uh, analyzing it separately? I mean, the kids die in so many creative ways. You know, it's just uh, could easily yeah. swamp out some relationship from, from the yeah. adults. Did you try yeah. doing it separately? I did. Yeah, I did. Um, I, I, I did separate the data set and just just ran it with with young birds and adults um, just to, to see. and. There, there was maybe there was a weak, a weak relationship with the young birds with one of the weather variables, but um, it it also didn't really make much sense, I think. So I but yeah, for the most part, there was there were no really clear effects, even when I separated the data set. Okay. Yeah, thank you. All right. So Patrick um, asks in the chat, I don't know if he's there and wants to go ahead and talk, but I can read it. Um, did you observe or do you suspect changes in seedling survival and or dispersal distance as a function of mast seed abundance? Uh, there you are, Patrick. I thought that I was am, you. I am here. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Hey, Jay, thank you. Hey. Um, I guess the context for me there would be with declines in oak abundance across the range. You know, are there missed opportunities in recruitment of oaks? Because if there are abundant seeds and those larger mass, that's when maybe dispersal is um, more efficient or more likely. I don't know if I couch that well. Uh, yeah, so um, so you're asking if, um, are you saying in relation to management when you say missed opportunities or? No, no I'm saying specifically with regard to dispersal by J. Okay. Like, are they, are they, are seeds surviving? Are they caching more seeds when they're right, are right, okay. seeds and are they moving them further or shorter distances? Yeah. So like I, I did not, I mean, it, part of it may, may have been sample size, um, but I did not detect any difference in, um, in distance cached or in survival um, or in location cached uh, by year. So over the three years, there were not strong um, differences, yeah, depending on the mass abundance. Um, I know that there, there have been a couple other studies that have found a little bit of that, I think, um, certainly with rodents. Um, so but then again, you know, it wasn't a huge sample size. So of the tag seeds, well, I mean, that that dispersal chart was like 102 um, was over all three years. That was like a number of caches that I had. So kind of separating that but by years, it wasn't, you know, it could be better. But um, yeah, I didn't detect anything like that. Yeah, I know. It, it was just sort of a thought question, too. But yeah, I mean, that that 102 seats is still super cool to <laughs> go find them all. That's wild. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was fun. Um, and yeah. yeah, it's cool. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Paul, I see you turned your camera on. Um, go, go ahead and ask your question if you'd like. You're, you're muted though.
Okay. I well, I wanted to uh, first. I wanted to say congratulations on completing such a project with Blue Jays. Over 20 years ago, I tried working with them, and I had to give up um, and switch gears completely. Uh, they're they're a headache. Um, I did also before I get to my question, wanted to jump on with what uh, Patrick was saying was that you know I you know we're all taught that these mashed years are all about trying to escape the seed predators of the tree, you know, like blue jays, like mice, et cetera. And yeah, it would seem to me that you would think that when there's a mashed year that there would be greater survivorship um, from this because there's more calories than the blue jay can eat in the winter, I would presume. I don't know if you if you know yeah, so so <clears throat> there's greater survivorship overall for for the tree for i mean like proportion wise right so like the the um the the number of acorns that would survive would be greater um but i guess okay yeah i think that at my site anyway there were just so many rodents anyway yeah. but like across the three years that they're fairly efficient at finding those acorns so um yeah, there. Yeah, that there's just like enough out there that I wasn't seeing any strong relationship. Because I think most of those predations, uh, the seed predations, were were rodents that were kind of digging them up, um, and I I never noticed any kind of like lower, yeah, lower predation. I mean that that is one thing I thought a lot about is like, is there any way I can do like rodent surveys also, <laughs> and and yeah. see if I can like kind of quantify that um because that's obviously like a big thing that's going to limit their just blue jays dispersal if, if they're the rodent populations but i just didn't yeah i wasn't really able to kind of work in a, a rodent population estimate um to the study although i would have liked to right and i've also thought that a uh yeah. a, a blue jay dying in the middle of the winter means that there's probably a couple thousand acorns that never get they never get back to too as a possibility um my, my question was just to get that out of the way and then I can be off is that, um, you know, you mentioned that the chestnuts are not their preferred item when they come to the feeding table. And I just wonder if that's something to do with their familiarity with it, because there, there aren't that many natural chestnuts for them to encounter to begin with. Yeah. Yeah. That, that was an interesting idea. And I, in the, in the paper I did, um, might've been in like the supplemental materials, but I do, I, I did look I tried to look at that. I tried to get at if if familiarity had um, had any influence on their chestnut selection by um, by kind of comparing the early studies to the. So I I forgot to mention this, or I didn't mention it in this talk. But when I did those trials, I had early season trials and I had late season trials, and so I I compared the early season trial and the preferences there to the late season trials to see if they were more preferred or if the chestnut um preference was you know greater or something in the late season after they were more familiar with it um it's been a little while since i looked at that i i don't think that there was a really strong uh evidence there um actually i, I might have to look at the look at that again to see exactly what i found um because I haven't looked at that particular result in a little while now, um, but it wasn't like really strong. Yeah, but that's definitely something that that could be, you know, the familiarity. But you know, being really curious, birds from observation wise, they often, you know, once a bird kind of realized that the chestnut was good food, they were they were taking it fine, um, and so I didn't see a lot of hesitation really um from most birds in that respect but yeah thanks good questions yeah david yeah this this is a great study and great presentation thank you jay thank and, you. and i love the fact that there's uh, somebody named jay who's uh, studying i know <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, it's it's fate that i <laughs> studied blue jay yeah, yeah. So I'm going to, I want to um, give you an opportunity to, to really speculate. So uh, a lot, some of my work has been on uh, the extinct passenger pigeons. And oh, okay. of course, they super abundant. They, they followed the, the masting years. They're um, incredibly effective uh, predators in terms of cleaning out an area 
of, of acorns and um, they ate acorns, didn't really eat many chestnuts um, mm, okay. and also beech seeds. And so I guess I'm, I'm just wanted if you had any speculation as to how the, the system might have been any different 150 plus years ago when uh, um, passenger pigeons were the dominant uh, bird of the eastern deciduous forest. Yeah, I mean, from what I've heard, I mean, I'm sure you know a lot more about this than I do, but from what I've heard of of how passenger pigeons, um, just like their behavior and their distribution, um, it was more, um, they maybe not were, were not as like widespread as blue jays were and, and like a widespread consistent thing, but but would have these like, you know, huge movements and so they might affect any one place like really heavily in a certain time um but and then they would move on so i think that you know evolutionarily or something they may have played a a big role in um you know looking at like the glacial post glacial expansion of of oaks um and kind of those long cuz oaks you know they expanded very rapidly um, so, you know, looking at how they had some of these long distance dispersals and if we have, you know, passenger pigeons that may have died in flight or something like that, um, they may have put, played a role there. I don't know that that they would have had a huge influence on on like the, the dispersal aspect of it just because, you know, they're not caching seeds. So the number of of like dispersal opportunities they would provide would be vastly lower than even though they're so abundant it would still be much lower i think than than blue jays would provide since they're actually like planting seeds um so I, yeah i don't know that i'm trying to think if there if there's anything else i could really say about that right now but um it's certainly interesting to think about what these forests were like when when you had that huge impact you know yeah just, just a, a quick response so one of my uh um, graduate student classmates, uh, Sarah Webb, who was a, um, a paleoecologist, uh, did some, it's kind of speculation, but that uh, um, that passenger pigeons probably were responsible for the dispersal of beech across uh, Lake Michigan, just as a pure probabilistic number with, with so many. But I'm thinking yeah, think in I've terms of the, the blue jay and dispersal situation that it might have been even more important in the low mast years when the huge flocks of passenger pigeons wouldn't just clean out the uh, the mast in the way that they would in the high years. So paradoxically, mm -hmm. when there's less mast, that uh, blue jays may have been more important than than in years of high mast. So yeah, just my yeah. speculation on that. Yeah, possibly. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, Roger, did you want to? Yeah, ahead? just a couple of questions. Um, did you look at, uh, besides rodent predation, uh, wild turkey or white-tailed deer? Uh, here in Minnesota, wild turkeys have just spread like wildfire across landscape. And, and we kind of wonder, you know, what their impact is gonna be on other species as they spread. Did you, do you have a big turkey population or deer population? Like most- There's a decent, yeah, there's a decent amount of turkeys and deer um, at, at the site. Um, I. From what I saw, none of my predations were turkey. I mean, because normally you can kind of see how they've sort of moved through an area and right. kind of just dis disturbed all the leaf litter like that. And so I don't, I don't remember seeing any of that at my sites. So I don't have any data on on that. Um, also, deer. I don't think that I did have some rabbit browse uh, on on some of my seedlings. Um, I don't know that I really had any deer browse because I mean, was, they were pretty short uh, just in one or two years. Um, so yeah, but I think, yeah, we, we, are, we are seeing bigger populations of Turkey here. Um, so that certainly could be, play a big role, but I don't really have any information on that from my study. And, and the other question I had was, um, one of the things we're seeing here is with uh, non-native, you know, you talked about the, the understory uh, and the, 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 you know, soil layer. Do you have any trouble with non-native earthworms? We're starting to see just a, a devastation in some areas of the leaf litter. 
you know, where there should be this nice layer of duff, there's just nothing. Uh, and, and that, you know, I, I think is going to have an impact across a lot of different things. Yeah. Yeah. I've been hearing about this more. And unfortunately, I, I mean, at the time when I was doing this, I wasn't all that aware of the earthworm issue. And I also don't have like a, like a longitudinal sort of uh, um, perspective on this site and what it may have looked like in the past. Um, so, I mean, for the most part, there were, I, yeah, I guess I don't know. I'd have to talk to Bill or the site manager to see if they've seen any differences over time in, in like the duff layer. Um, I mean, there was a, there was a, a duff layer. I wouldn't say it was like substantial. I don't know, Matt, do you have any? I, I, I was going to say, that? I mean, you know, living in Appalachian forests for most of my life, um, mm -hmm. at least in Ohio and in West Virginia and places, it, there doesn't seem to be much of an effect yet. Um, but I have seen sites where they have had a pretty substantial impact outside of the state. Mm. So I don't think it's affected us locally, at least in southeastern Ohio yet. You may be experiencing it more in the Toledo area before you realize it. Oh, okay. Well, here, here in Minnesota, <laughs> it's kind of a side effect of the fishing industry. Yeah. People oh, buy yeah. bait worms, dump them. And there are places where you can almost draw a line on the ground and know where the earthworms are and where they're not. Yeah. Because they just take wow. all that organic matter out. Yeah, I, I know there are sites. Um, it, it's more prominent around the Great Lakes, and it is just as you're saying, you know, directly related to fishing. And so there has been a lot of outreach in some of the park systems. Um, I don't know if, if Toledo has done anything yet um, around education with uh, dumping bait in areas um, for uh, forest management protection issues. Yeah, I'll have to keep that in mind. I think I'm thinking now that there is actually a researcher that's going to be doing an earthworm study on some of our parks this this year. So I'll have to I'll have to kind of meet with them and see what they think about that. Yeah, here it's it's a lot about uh, spring ephemerals, wildflowers, mm -hmm. just some of those sub you know, those those lower layers. But if oaks respond to open areas, uh, more open areas, that actually might be something that that moves them into areas they haven't been around, at least here in Minnesota. Mm, yeah. Mm. Um, any other questions? I don't see any more in the chat. Let me check YouTube. I don't think we have any there either. Um, yeah, Jay, I always love hearing about this study. It's, it's so cool. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, so it, it's, it's a fun study. Yeah. So thanks. Thanks again for taking time uh, and, and presenting for us here uh, during the cafe. Um, if we don't have any other questions, um, thanks everyone so much for joining and, and participating in the conversation and hope to see you in our May meeting um, and learn about Birds of Gramado and um, everything else that's going on in AFO. Um, so thanks again. And uh, yeah, have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.